rifling through his pockets, butt ass naked, and like an epiphany comes to me like, shit, what if he busts me and I gotta get out from under this bed? Welcome to the Recovery Idiot. My name is Leroy. I'm a recovered alcoholic addict. And today I'm sitting with a gentleman who I have to spend a lot of time with because he's my fucking boss. And that shit sucks so much. But he's been around a lot longer than I have. And he's worked his program. He has an exciting story. And he's gone from rags to riches. Literally, I think. He owns a boat. That's more than I'll ever own. I sold it two weeks ago. Same thing. To be able to say you sold a boat is some baller shit. So everybody, this is Derek. What's up, y'all? I'm Derek, alcoholic. That's it? I think you're a drug addict, Oh, uh, definitely a drug addict, without a doubt. And most of my um, story does revolve around drugs, but I've always just identified myself as an alcoholic because I know alcohol will bring me to my demise just as fast as anything else will. So my story... How did you get from the mountains of wherever the fuck, Bill, to Florida? So I was born in Pennsylvania, uh, northeastern Pennsylvania, Scranton. Um, where, where the office takes place? Yeah, where the office is. <laughs> show. That's what I was going to say. And that, honestly, I watch that show every single night to put myself to sleep. And it's got no re- relevance to where no, I'm from. I watch Seinfeld every night to go to sleep. Yeah, it's just one of those uh, heart-soothing shows that mm-hmm. I enjoy. Yeah, so I, uh, I was born in Pennsylvania. My family, um, my mom and dad were divorced. I don't even know if they were ever really married uh, when I was born. Left there, moved to... Stewart, or Palm City, actually, off of Boat Ramp Road. And uh, at a young age, I think I was in third grade, I started in school here. And um, my dad's side of the family, and my dad stayed in Pennsylvania, and I came down here with them, with my mom and uh, grandparents. So we lived with them uh, out in Palm City, and probably middle school, and that's when things started. You know, I was getting influenced by my buddies, older brothers, and things like that. I think the first time me and my buddy Dylan got caught and got in some trouble, we uh, we ended up smoking some weed with his brother on a camp out one night, and uh, he went to church the next Sunday and confessed <laughs> in confession, and we got busted. I don't know if the priest ratted him out or what happened, but... I thought that's the whole point of doing confession. They can't rat you out. Well, you never know. It's a priest. You can't trust him, dude. So he went, and then... The next day, dude, I got busted. His dad came and told my family and whatever. It shit happened. So that was going to be a pattern for the next couple of uh, years of my life that I didn't know. My mom finally was able to move out. I got, I got a stepdad. She married. And uh, he was a good guy, hard worker, but he smoked weed, which whatever. At that time, of age, I mean, I, it was probably 93, 94, something like that. Um, that was the norm. You know, he drank beer, worked, smoked weed. Yeah, so how, how old are you? I am 38. All right, so I'm 40-something, but 93, 94, those were the days when you drank a 40 and smoked weed all the time. Yeah, it was a and good time. And went to work, and we all functioned. But and that was the thing. Everybody did it. That was the norm. So we did that. I got busted. My mom moved out, and we were in, um, I think I was in sixth grade at the time over at Hidden Oaks, and I wasn't able to go to school in our district, Martin County, because uh, where we lived, we lived off of Becker Road at the time, and um, I took one of my father, or my stepdad's uh, pot pipes, and took it to school to sell it to my buddy, and they were already in the bathroom going at it, smoking, and um, obviously I tried. I sold it. My buddy, like an idiot, got scared when the teacher came in, throws it in the toilet, and it won't flush. And I see it there, and I'm just like, dude, terrible idea. So we get kicked out of Martin County School District, get kicked out of school, like four or five of us in there just chiefing. I end up having to go to St. Lucie County, and they all went to Spectrum. I don't know if that was a saving grace for me or what, but I ended up at Fort Pierce Central. It was terrible. That was a terrible high school. I remember getting jumped on the first day. Three dudes in the bathroom wanted my shoes more than they cared about me. So got jumped there. Fast forward out of high school. I kind of played it cool in high school. All I really did was smoke weed. I I had a couple buddies messing around with pills, but it really wasn't my thing and uh, really didn't mess with it. And then one night I remember it gave me a Valium. They are like, try this. I thought I was the smartest man in the world. Like, I could figure out anything. I was so slick and conniving. Needless to say, I started stealing. 
Because I can get away with it, dude. No one can see me. No, and stealing is a lot easier when you got some benzos in your system. It just comes natural. The confidence you get, dude. Like, it is the unbelievable. The cops could be standing right in front of the exit at Walmart. I got a cart full of flat screen TVs <laughs> and crest white strips and razor blades. I'm walking out. I'm nodding to him and saying, good evening, sir. As I walk out, don't give a fuck. That they ain't got a clue. confidence. Yeah, I remember one night at Clematis Street. I walked out of the back of a nightclub. I'm 18 years old at this time. I walked right out of the nightclub, and right on the main street, there was a car with the windows open. And I jumped through the window, snatched the stereo system out, and proceeded to just walk across the street with wires dangling 10 feet behind me and cops right up the road. And I just thought I had it together. Those good old days. So one night, me and a friend were going down to Clematis. You know, we got off work. I was a plumber at the time. And we got off work on Friday, went to the mall after we got... we got, I think we scored like 15 Xanax. And uh, went to the mall and we bought all new outfits for the night. Like, <laughs> I wish I could see. They all got cut off of us, you know, later in the night. And I'll explain that. But, like... We bought shoes, socks, the whole shebang. Like, went out there like we were looking like vanilla ice. You know, just ready to go. Yeah. I, I remember the Whatever it was popular, cross we weren't in like that. We had, uh, it was like skateboard shoes and like, I had a nice hat that matched everything and I thought that was the shit. And they didn't cut that, so that was cool. So we go down there and we're dancing at this club, dude. And me and my boy thought we could dance. Wes, if you see this, dude... You can dance, and I love you. He's got a big resentment against me still to this day, and uh, we don't talk. So I do hope this video reaches him, maybe. So we go down there, and we're going at it, partying. I was dating some girl from Palm Beach, and I can't even remember her name or anything. Uh, but she met us at the club. We went to a house party and then went back to the club. And we're leaving. I'm 95, and I remember uh, I'm driving. I got my own pickup. He's in the passenger seat, passed out. And I remember seeing the Jupiter exit two miles sign on I-95. I grab my cigarette pack and I grab uh, the joint out of there and I say to myself, I'm going to light this up as soon as I hit Jupiter. And that was the last thing I said to myself. I passed out at the steering wheel and we got into a wreck on 95, flipped the vehicle. I flew out the sunroof. I broke my back. He broke his uh, femur and his jaws with my uh, wired shut. I remember waking up on the side of 95 and that burning feeling that you get when you break a bone... I never was familiar with it, and I thought there were ants crawling down my butt crack because I broke a, my lower back. A tingly type. It's a feeling. weird feeling, and I, you, I just never experienced it, so I didn't know what I was looking for. And I remember people hovering around me. It was very foggy and daisy, um, and they were like, "Stop moving! Stop moving! I'm trying to get these ants out of my ass crack." And little did I know, my back was broke. So they put me in the helicopter. And I came to for a second, and they were asking me, "Where were you alone? Were you alone?" And I said, "No, Wes." which is my buddy. That was it. You know, I woke up two days later, I think, and Wes comes rolling up in the wheelchair in the, ho in the hospital, like when I come to it, and he's just got a smile on his face, his mouth's wired shut, and he's like, dude, that was a hell of a night. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just like, what the fuck is happening, bro? Yeah, we get that done. So the next like three or four weeks was rehab, and I'm in uh, a turtle shell. From here all the way down to my pelvis, and he's got whatever kind of pain medicine, and I got mine, and we're blending this shit up in smoothies because his mouth is wired shut. His mom's blending stuff up. She has no idea, and we're just putting these pills and Roxaset in it. So that was a whole daze for like a um, few weeks until we ran out of that stuff. And then uh, that didn't stop me, you know. I kept going. I'd be in nightclubs with this turtle shell on, and everyone thought I had like a bulletproof vest on, and I'm all upright, standing, you know, running funny. After I did PT for my back and I started to recoup, I was still in a lot of pain. I didn't have to have a surgery, it was just a compressed fracture. Pain, it was during the, like, the pill mills and, you know, all that. So I was getting the medication and then all of a sudden I got cut off. Like, they just cut me off. And, you know, to find them on the streets was super expensive and I couldn't steal enough for What that. year was this? This was, uh, 2003, 2004. I think that was... I didn't know there were pill mills back then, but in Kansas City, where I was at that time, you could just go, there were certain doctors, you just went to, you got an MRI, you pointed to your pain level, and they gave you 270 of 40s, 80s, whatever it was. And I didn't think there was anything strange about it. I actually, I've had this talk with people before, 
I thought I was the only person in the world that got high off pills because I knew other people that had them and they didn't like them. Or they get prescribed Vicodin or Percocet. They'd be like, I took one, it felt funny, I don't want to do this, so I take it. So in my head, I'm the only one in this like pill world. But there was so many all the time that even when I ran out, someone had a bunch they didn't want because they liked meth and they were just using it to sell shit. And it wasn't until one day in probably 2004, this is how I got on methadone, party for weeks straight, I just got back from traveling, just didn't feel like going out and getting, and I'm laying in bed and I'm sweating and I start feeling like I got the flu. I don't understand why. And I filled up, I had a shower that was in the bathtub. I've never taken a bath before, but I had so little energy, I was like, I'm going to take a bath because I can't stand up in the shower. <laughs> so I fill up the bathtub, I go and sit down, and I'm like, what is happening? Like, why do I, I, no one I knew was sick. Like, what's wrong? And a friend of mine, Jeremy, he came around like a couple hours later, and we did something, and I felt normal. And it just continued again. Eventually, I went to the methadone clinic. But it wasn't until years later, I was looking back like, oh, you were That's fucking what that addicted. Was. That's <laughs> what that was. <laughs> That's why my life is fucking in shambles. So I, uh, like, it wasn't a common occurrence for the pill mills. Like, I didn't do it at the time. But I knew people that did. And they, like you were saying, it was a rare doctor. You Like, a buddy of a buddy had to know somebody that knew someone that. There was a guy right here across US1 from us, actually, that um, he had like four or five customers that he would get their MRI, get all their stuff for it, take them to the doctor, and he would obtain all their yes. medication. A sponsor. Which was the great. The first sponsor I ever yeah. learned about was when people were sponsoring people, which meant pay for your doctor's appointment and give you a ride, then I take all the pills. Exactly. And he would, if you had uh, like gift cards for Home Depot or anything, He'd give you like 75 cents for the dollar. So that was a good score. Ultimately, my life went down in shambles, you know, not long after that because I, I continued to search for them pills and, you know, heroin was much cheaper at the time. Fentanyl was a rare commodity. If you could find that, that was great. But um, heroin, I got on it because it was cheaper. Fentanyl wasn't really around too much at the time. It was all... Um, medical grade the patches yeah the patches or what was that morphine sulfate in liquid like from the hospital bottles <laughs> and i didn't really have a i didn't need that i wasn't shooting up regularly at the time once i got to that point you know it was a, a quick uh, downhill ride for me but um one time my uncle he calls me up and i'm hanging out with him and he i he knew i had the real bad back pain so he gives me one of these fentanyl patches and he pulls it out of a garbage bag, and there's like 300. And then there's bottles of morphine sulfate, like big bottles. And I'm like, dude, where the hell did you get this shit? And um, he tells me his buddy that works at the hospital had to throw it all in the dumpster because it was expired. And I'm like, eyes like this, trying to play it cool. And he's so, my uncle's like a conspiracy theorist kind of. He's got it buried in his backyard. Right? In a hole. When I was over there one day, I was trying to look for fresh grass patch to try to figure out where this is. So one night, it's like 3 in the morning, and I'm in his backyard with a shovel digging up this garbage bag. <laughs> and I'm out there sweating bullets, you know, but I know the, I know the treasure is here somewhere. It's like beyond, right beyond the rainbow. I know it's here. So I, I find it, and, I, you know, I, I'm like, I'm going to play this smart. Just gonna take some. Just a little bit, so he doesn't know. And then I got this this plug forever. So it was a golden opportunity. And I did that for a while, but that fentanyl was strong at the time, man. Like, I wasn't ready for that. Yeah, after that, I went I went to my first detox. Yeah, 2005. Went to New Horizons, mm. and I remember carving my name in the picnic bench outside. And I remember being there the following year on the same exact date, and I carved my name again <laughs> like an idiot. That's one thing I do remember. And um, in that detox, I ran into or, uh, the dude Blake, Blake Beach from here in town. He uh, he had a halfway house at the time. Him and uh, another fella named Charles, and they showed up and they had um, they had a Mercedes Benz Benz with twenty inch rims, and that appealed to me at the time. <laughs> and that was like the only reason I was like intrigued by them because they brought the AA meeting in and shared their hope. All I saw was the Mercedes Benz, you know. And uh, that's when I first met Blake, so thanks, Blake, you asshole. Obviously, detox didn't help. I went to a, a halfway house once I got out of there. A seed was planted there, but it definitely, I wasn't ready yet. I was still pretty young. I left there after staying at the halfway house for probably six months or so. 
I just I wasn't taking it serious. I was still eating methadone and you know just getting by. I was young. I was still having fun. The lies I was telling myself. Yeah, I can't imagine quitting at that age. Yeah, it it wasn't in the cards for me yet. I continued digging myself deeper, and my family starting to recognize it. And my sister, I remember telling me, she's like, "Hey, do you want to go to rehab?" And I was like, "I don't want to go, but I know you guys are gonna make me pretty much." So they gave me like some options where I wanted to go. One was Georgia. One was in Pennsylvania, which I ain't trying to go back there. I didn't, I didn't even listen. I never been to Atlanta at the time, so that's all I heard. So that's what I was like, "Hell yeah, I'll go to Georgia, Atlanta," you know. So I go to Atlanta. Don't look up this place at all, right? And I remember on the ride up there, I got some shit. And it's in my shoe. And I'm pretending to grab it out of my shoe and cough and shoving it in my mouth so my sister can't tell. And uh, I think we got pulled over. And I'm sure I made a fool of myself in the cop, in front of the cop because I'm pretty sure I got out of the car and told my sister, don't worry about it, I got it. Because I got it together, dude. I'm on Xanax, bro. I'm surprised she didn't let me drive. So we're going up there. And I get in, and I'm like, man, this place is weird. Come to find out, dude, it's a fucking Scientology <laughs> rehab, bro. And I don't know if you guys done any fucking research on that shit, but Ron L. Hubbard or whatever his name is, that yes, guy if is If you have not wild. watched some documentaries on Netflix about Scientology, check it out. Because it'll make being a drug addict look amazing. It's such a better choice than becoming a Scientologist. There is some crazy shit they do, dude. I remember staring at some dude's face six inches away from me for like three hours saying the bird will fly. And I couldn't break eye contact. And then they shoved me in this sauna at a hundred and, I don't know, it was like 120 degrees for four hours a day, pumping me full of carrots, fucking niacin, and water. Dude, I come out of this it thing... Flush the addiction out of your system. Like a prune. But I thought, like, for sure, I was cured after this. And then that didn't work out. Um, How long were you with the Scientology? Details? So I told them I'm going to make sure that this only takes uh, 90 days for me. So I, I didn't go in there with an open mind whatsoever. I wasn't done. I was still trying to have a good time. The, the program, I think, was six months. Or however long they can get money out of your insurance. Which, I didn't have insurance. My family backed me up and... Thanks, everyone that threw in on that. That That is one of men's that um, I'll have to always repay. Uh, I appreciate that. Uh, it didn't work, but I appreciate that gesture. Uh, Dad's still holding a fucking grudge about that one. It was like 1100 bucks, bro. Um, okay. I learned how to shoot up heroin in rehab there at the Narconon place. Um, it was white heroin, and that was new to me. So I enjoyed that, and then I also did that black tar heroin there. I set the date that I'm leaving. Like, I tell the counselor one day I'm leaving like I, I graduated or something. And uh, my sister picks me up. And the night before, we made homemade moonshine, which that was a first for me. And I will never drink that again. But it worked. And um, she picked me up the next day, and I got the hell out of there. Burned every bridge on the way out of that place. There was one counselor there. I don't remember her name, but she was great. She said that, because uh, in the book it said that you know, there's a possibility of you never recovering. And that stuck with me where I just, I couldn't get over that hump where like, what do you mean I'll never recover? Like I wanted to, you know, I I didn't want to do the work to get fixed and feel better, but I wanted to know that there was something out there that there's a possibility that I can be better if I tried. So I left there and, you know, it's a tailspin, dude. I went right back to the bullshit. You know, getting high, stealing from the family. My grandmother and grandfather, they just couldn't trust me. I pawned off like my grandfather's great-great-grandfather's Italian gold bracelet. And like, that one still hurts a little bit. You know, the, and I probably got like two Roxy's for it. My mom shudders. We live in Florida, hurricane season, and like her shutters only got me like 45 bucks. I'm still buying her plywood every year, dude. Fifteen years later, I'm still buying plywood every year in case of a fucking hurricane. Um, probably should buy the real shutters, but prices have increased, y'all. Luckily for me, I stole from everyone else. I didn't really steal from family. There was one time I stole $100 from my stepdad, and it killed me. Like, I couldn't believe things that got this bad that I am stealing money. Because I always just stole shit and sold it. Or I robbed somebody and took their drugs. But I, I actually forgot about it for a while. And I'd say probably within the past year, 
I was sitting at a meeting and it came back to me and I was like, you stole that fucking hundred dollars. And I argued so long to my mom, why would I do that? You know I steal everything else. I would never steal from you. <laughs> and of course I did. So I wrote him this long letter. I put a hundred dollars in the envelope and it killed me. Like I've done so much work the past four years. They're going to read this. And it's just, we were right. He was a scumbag. Fuck him. <laughs> and out of, I, I kind of forgot about it one day. I'm at work and I get a text and it says, I don't remember, but thank you. And I was like, ah, Hell that's yeah, the dude. reason why we make a mess. I lived down the road. Uh, we were going through a hurricane. It was Gene Francis and whatever the other one was. And me and my stepdad were at the house together. And um, it's a hurricane. you got no air conditioning, cold water. It's freaking brutal. So he's passed out in his bed. And I know he's got Xanax and weed. So... Um, it, I come up, I wake up from a dead sleep, and that t- first thing that pops into my mind, like, he's got Xanax. And I know he's out because he's taking the Xanax. Dude, I'm butt-ass naked. I army crawl across the house, under his bed, and I'm rifling through, <laughs> I'm rifling through his pockets, butt-ass naked, and like an epiphany comes to me like, shit, what if he busts me, and I gotta get out from under this bed? So I ended up getting them and never got busted. But, I mean, the crazy shit that, like, we put ourselves through. I'll never forget just laying there, balls rubbing across the carpet. You know, just like, oh, shit, what if he catches me? <laughs> All sweaty and shit because we got no AC. I'm over there fucking under this dude's bed. I go to a friend of mine. I remember I was just running. I burned a lot of bridges. All I had was a pickup truck to my name at this point, And it was $200 a month. And my cell phone bill, which was like 75 bucks. I was at, they were building a development up the road here. And they were at the pool, I was at the pool house. And I remember my phone was dead. I wasn't able to make my truck payment. And I called the only person I know. His name was Dave B. He was sober at the time for like 18 years. Um, I was best friends with his son. His son never smoked weed, never drank. But we were, we were good friends. The whole family, they kind of took me under the wing because uh, my dad wasn't around. So I, I had like that father figure in my life. And uh, he took the role and like he, we, he showed me a good, good family time. And um, I called Dave and I'm like, yo, I'm in a jam. I, uh, I need some help. And he said, come on out to the house. So I drove out to Indian Town and I stayed there for, uh, it was like early November. I stayed there, and his son and brother had to drive to Kentucky the next day, and I was about to go into the rehab, but they wanted a um, hundred bucks for the blood work to get done for me to get in. So his brother, my buddy Stefan, his name's Steven, he uh, he gave me a hundred bucks on top of the the TV, and I'm a fucking dopehead, piece of shit, you know. He gives me a hundred bucks on top of the TV. I'm one eyeing it, pretending I'm sleeping in the bed because they leave at like 5:30 in the morning. And like, soon as that door shuts, I'm looking out the window, letting letting them go past the driveway. And like, I snag that hundred bucks. I go to town, do my thing. I come back to Dave's house. He's like, "All right, let's go to Dunklin'. So I go over there and I tell him what happened. I tell him I get high. They make me wait like three more days, so Dave doesn't let me leave his sight. So I go in there. So for anyone who doesn't know about Dunklin', oh yeah, yeah. Anybody I know that has gone there has said it's worse than prison. Or it's basically, what, Catholic prison? Christian prison? What religion do they... It's Christianity. Okay. And I know one person... I'm On steroids. Yeah. So one person I know that went there and graduated, not long after he got out, his head is no longer attached to his body. Yeah. And so there's, you know, legends about Dunklin and the type of things they do and how bad it is. So you actually went to Dunklin'. Yeah, so I went to Dunklin' and I didn't know anything about the place. Like, I knew my buddy, like my best friend, he made a transition in his life where he stopped drinking and everything. And I didn't know why or what was going on, but I knew there was something different about him. And uh, so he was a pastor at a a rodeo um, church right next door to Dunklin'. So he had an inn for me. And um, I go in there, and this place is a... It's a work camp, dude, but they really instill God in your life. Whether you want it or not, dude, they're putting it there. So the first day, he's like, all right, I'll bring you to your dorm. So I go in there, and I'm detoxing off methadone. You know, terrible. 
Like, the joints are just killing me at this point. Everyone knows what that's like. Um, and I'm like, all right, I'm just going to lay down, take it easy. And the guy's like, oh, yeah, no problem. And he chuckled a little bit, and he's like, just come with me real quick. He brings me to this sawmill, dude. And I'm in there with, like, 8 by 8 by 15 foot chunks of wood, dude, on my shoulder, dying slowly with slivers and fucking lumber, just dying, dude, trying to tote this shit around. And then I'm like, man, I got a headache. They got like four dudes coming around. They just prey on you. Like just putting hands on you, praying for you. So while you're detoxing. And I'm, yeah, this is all new to me. I've never been in a, a place like this. I had no idea about Christianity or religion was me, to me was always just like Catholic or like God's putting you down. It wasn't, there was no relation, no relationship between me and God at the time. There was it just nothing on my end, you know what I mean? I just kind of figured, you know, my old ways got me here, so I might as well put a little effort into it. So that's what I did. I, I hit the ground running. I, I, you know, I got involved there, and was, you, know, you got to get involved whether you want to or not. These people, they, they're, they're waking you up at 5 a.m. to go work in this sawmill for like three hours before you eat breakfast. And on top of it, some people got to wake up at like 2 just to crack eggs so that everyone can eat breakfast. It's, it's a lot of work, man. So I'm there for like two months at this point, and my buddy found like some Benadryl in the lumber mill. And I remember him coming to my dorm, and he's like, yo, you want to, uh, you want some Benadryl? And I was like, no, dude, I, I don't. And that was the first time making that decision for myself, where I was like, I mean, it's Benadryl, but it's Benadryl. It's better you know? than nothing if you're... So I'm like, up. all right. I said, no, him and another dude end up taking it. They, they steal a truck from the damn camp, bro. Go to Okeechobee, hit the liquor store up, get into this f- fatal accident when, they, when they're trying to come back, man. And the one dude's um, brain dead. The other dude, he's running. They don't know where he is. And, um, you know, God saved my life that night, without a doubt. John, that guy, he was paralyzed, like brain dead, dude. And he's still around now. I see him on Facebook up there in Vero. So, holla, John. So, my mom, I'm telling on you here a little bit, Ma. My mom's supplying me with dip while I'm there because they allowed no nicotine, no cell phones, no TV. Uh, you don't leave this compound. Like I mean, I'm talking, you're butchering your own animals here. We're growing our own food, and you're cutting the shit out of some wood, making pallets. I don't know how many times I saw people shoot their hands with a pallet gun. I'm getting, I'm getting into it now. Like I'm three months in, I stopped cursing. I'm, I'm drinking the Kool Aid. Life's getting pretty good, actually, for me. I have some peace. Um, put some weight on. I look presentable. Like an idiot, I started, you know, sharing my dip. And some dude ratted me out. I still see him on Facebook, too. What's his damn name? I'll call his ass out. Whatever. He ratted me out because he got caught. And uh, he brought me in. they brought me into the office, and they're like, Hey, uh, here's what we know. Here's what's going on. We got to kick you out of here. And that was the decision. I remember making the decision like, hey, my life's been pretty good for this three months. I've ne- I haven't been this sober this long ever. So it was like a Y in the road for me or a fork in the road. And I was like, well, let me continue this, you know, see if it works out for me. It's been working. So I kept making these uncomfortable changes in my life that I normally wouldn't have done because it, it felt abnormal and what was normal for me was always getting me in trouble. So I made these changes. Um, I started hanging out with that dude, Stefan. He took me right under his wing when I got kicked out again. And, um, you know, I just hung out there as long as I could because I knew that was a safe space for me. And they were talking about stuff encouraging and, um, you know, the future, what they wanted to do with their lives, where my old buddies, we were just trying to rob someone the next day to get high. So that's what we did. I stayed with them probably a year, something like that. And um, I met my wife at a bar drinking sweet tea. And I was like nine months sober, I think, or ten months sober at the time. I started going to AA like right after, right before I met my wife. I, I think I got my ten-month chip at an AA meeting. And uh, I did go to AA when I was younger. But that was the first time I like actually in, involved myself in AA. I really didn't know what it was about. I started going. Um, an old running buddy got sober just about a year before me, 
Andrew and um, A Bomb, and I saw him there, and you know we hit it off, and I was like, "Yo, why don't you be my sponsor?" So he did. We started going through the steps, and man, my life changed. I'm ten months sober. I'm super active in AA. You know, it's a young people's group. I'm super active in that. I'm doing Celebrate Recovery, and I'm working air conditioning out in Indian Town. Um, and the one thing they drill in your head is don't make any big decisions in your first year. Don't date. Don't. And what'd you do? Here we are, baby. Well, you would be the actual only one person who met a girl in their first year of sobriety. And, and it still actually worked out. Yeah. We have two children together, and... Uh, it's a great thing because she could drink, but she can't. She's not one of us. You know, she's able to keep it together sometimes. She likes <laughs> to have a good time. <laughs> Nothing wrong with that. I did the Celebrate Recovery. I started getting with Andrew quite a bit, and we had a really tight group at the time. There's probably 10, 12 of us younger people. I was 23 years old when I was, it was 11, 18, 2008. You know, I got sober when I went into Dunklin. Never touched anything since. Went to those meetings, started getting involved. All of us. I mean, like every Halloween, we would have these parties, these gatherings where it was all young people. And it, it, was, it was a good vibe, good feeling, and it kept you coming back. Started doing the steps and started getting pretty active there. And me and um, quite a few people, we started to, uh, what is it, reap some of that fruit that we sown, right? Yeah, reap the fruit that we sown. My wife began, she got pregnant. I remember getting that phone call, and I was so scared because I'm 23 years old been with her for like a year and a half. My wife got pregnant with my first son and I was scared shitless, but I didn't I didn't know how to show my emotions because I was just I was 23 years old. I had no idea. And I remember my wife taking it as like she was scared as shit and you know, men we don't really show our emotions that much and um, I remember that look of discernment or uh, look of concern that she had where it was uh did I fuck up <laughs> getting with this dude cuz she has no idea about my past really. My wife, she never saw me drink a beer, never saw me do anything. She's marrying me. She's about to get marry me, you know? So we end up going to Las Vegas, get married by Elvis. We got the pink Cadillac special. That's what it was. And uh, we got married by Elvis out there. Vegas sucks if you're not drinking or <laughs> drugging, whatever. Um, we come back, and our life's starting to get established. I think we're in about 2010 at this point. And um, I'm still working out in Indian Town, and... I lose that job, and the boss there, she was a great woman, and she still is, uh, Donna, shout out. She um, she offered to pay for my books to get my contractor license, and at the time, that was like 900 bucks, and that was way more than I could afford, so that was a huge gesture, and you know that really set, set me up for life, and that was a huge thing. Um, so I took the test twice, and I finally passed it. I passed the um, business finance for the first time, and I, I couldn't pass the trade knowledge because it's so fucking stupid, but I passed that the second time and got my AC contracting license. And uh, I was working at the school district, Martin County School District. Yeah, I just found that out from that guy. Oh, Dave? Yeah, he used to work for local guys. At well, he, we worked together, yeah, and then he would work weekends. He said he'd do on-call, yeah, too, and it yeah. sucked. I know. I he does. On-call for air conditioning common. sucks. <laughs> Every one of us hate it, but we still do it. Except for Nick, motherfucker. <laughs> <laughs> I got that license, and I started my business. It was 2012 now, or 2000, late 2011, I think. I started local guy air conditioning. So I got lucky because I also got kicked out of school when I was younger. And uh, my mom made me work with my uncle. And my uncle had his own air conditioning company. And me and him worked together. And he basically became the father figure in my life because my real dad, it was a complicated story, but my mom and dad got divorced. And I ended up spending every minute with my uncle. And he taught me how to do so much stuff. Taught me about electricity. Taught me about air conditioning. Taught me about quaaludes and white crosses and black and tans. And oh, God, we had so much fun. But... The stuff I learned back when I was 15 somehow carried me to this point because at any time in my life when I bottom out, I could get a job in air conditioning. <laughs> yeah. yes, <you> <laughs> There's always something I know that somebody's looking for. And one of the things about working for you, you gave me a job when I was still in the halfway house. I had no teeth. Um, I had a little tiny car that I just bought for, I think, $1,000, which is every penny I had. And you took a chance and... Gave me a job, and you've given a lot of other people chances in your company that come from the program. And I mean, that's 
at the time, I don't think you were sponsoring anybody, but I know giving people from halfway houses opportunity to get their life together and work air conditioning is a big thing. And you know, throughout the uh, the recovery world, people come up to me and, hey, I worked for Derek once, I worked for Derek once. <laughs> so yeah. you've given a lot of opportunities to people. And uh, where they went with it, that was all up to them because we've seen several people sputter out. But. Dude, I appreciate that. Thank you very much. And that was a huge part. Are you done? Yeah, Yo, that was a huge part of like what I do. A funny one is though, dude, I hire this kid Friday from a halfway house. He shows up Monday with a full blown neck tattoo that comes down from his cheeks right here, dude, all the way down his neck. <laughs> I'm like, dude, I can't let you work in these people's houses looking like that. It was like a freaking swastika and I'm just like, dude. But I mean those are the people that you get, like, the devil's junkyard, you know? Like, that's the people that I'm rooting for, the underdogs, the ones that can't make it. When you showed up in that fucking blue wasp car or whatever that thing with Geo Metro, like, I was like, this is the guy that, that Blake sends me? Huh? Okay. I didn't even think it was a Metro. It was some bizarre car that I've never seen I can't even remember again. what it was. I'll have to look it up. I'll put a picture of it right there. Yeah. It was a very... Fast, bro. Came in that corner fast. Gay. The word I was looking for is a very gay <laughs> car. 2012, I finally, I quit that job. Life was really rolling at the time. Like, I, I was still trying to make ends meet. I didn't have money, but I had that piece of heart because of what AA offered me, man. I, uh, I got involved with, you know, old timers because those are the guys that told me what I needed to do and would call me out on my shit. I knew that they had some and it was working for them. And if it worked for them, there's a chance that it might work for me. So why not give it a shot? The years passed by. I didn't get a sponsor or a sponsee for quite some time. You know, the turnaround time, it really hardens your heart. And then me owning that business was just so damn stressful. I had, um, we had two kids now. We got two freaking dogs living in a 900 square foot house at my grandfather's. Three dogs now? I got three motherfuckers now. <laughs> so I, had, I accidentally killed a cat by starting my pickup truck. Oh, I forgot. It was my, my son's cat. I'm going to the gym at 4.30 in the morning. I turned the key over to get the fuel pump to scare everything uh, away. And I, I turned it over, dude, and did it, did it. The cat freaking died. Um, fan blade hit it. So I had to buy, buy him a dog. So yeah, we got three dogs now. So based on like some of the other people that have worked for me, I've been burned quite a bit, but I had to get a, what did I have? Oh, hemorrhoids. No, it wasn't hemorrhoids. I think I had hemorrhoids and I got my, my balls snipped. And I'm working by myself and I had to put a condenser in. So I call the halfway house. I get this kid. His name's Pat. So Pat starts working for me because I, all I could do is drive. I couldn't freaking lift nothing. I got a hemorrhoid and fucking my nuts just got snipped. And uh, he ended up working, he was young, dude, I think he was 19 years old at the halfway house, and he worked with me for like the next four or five years, and um, then he came back, he relapsed a few times, and I, I hope he's doing well now, I don't talk to him as much, he did reach out to me, I just, um, you become hard hearted, it's hard, it it's sad to say it, man, but I've been burned so many times, and I and try to give everyone the doubt. Nothing personal too, but I have so many people that reach out to me all the time, that if you're not in my top 10, 15 texts of the day, I forget. And time moves quick. It does. And I mean, when you're doing working, working multiple jobs, doing stuff like this, going to meetings, all this stuff, there's people that reach out or you kind of forget about them. And I mean, I got nothing against a lot of people that went back out, but the same thing, you know, usually when people are reaching out, it's because they're fucked up and that's when they decide they want to say hi. Exactly. And then on top of it, you know, you start doing well for yourself and you see more and more people reaching out. I don't know, if I see someone doing well, like, yeah, you're attracted to that because you, you want that same thing for yourself, you know? So I tried to give everyone the benefit of the doubt, but I'm always, like, an underdog story. Like, that's what I want. Like, the people that don't have a chance, I want them to come out on top. So as far as recovery goes, when I started uh, the AA 2009, I, um, I started with the Monday Night AA study group at uh, Fellowship Hall, 7 o'clock. You know, I went through the process. I, uh, I started as a coffee maker. Hated that, so I made the coffee terrible so they wouldn't ask me to make it anymore. And that lasted, uh, or that worked. So then I went to the treasurer, and that was pretty easy, just working with money. And I was not too used to doing that because I had no money. So I also taught me how to balance checkbooks and balances and things and um, you know speaker the whole thing but today I'm still a member of that home group and that's the the AA meeting that I try to 
make no matter what. You know, that's one of those priorities in my life. So my wife has dealt with me going to that Monday night AA meeting for 15 years now, <laughs> and she still bitches about it. She just doesn't get it, you know? Not everyone does what we do and gets service commitments and does as many things as we do, but the people that get service commitments and do shit like we do stay around. And I mean, they say get a sponsor, get a home group, get a commitment. I see a lot more people that get commitments and stay around than people who just show up at meetings and don't do shit. You've been doing this 15 years, you know. My friend's wife complains all the time that he's got to go to meetings still. And people in the normal world are like, well, you haven't drank for three years, four years. Can't you just stop? Aren't you cured? And there's a part in the big book that I try to stress to everyone about resting on your laurels because that's what happens. You get a couple years of life gets good. You haven't thought about drinking or drugs in a while. I guess I can stop. That's it, dude. <laughs> and that's when we see people with four years, five years, six years, seven years. They're right back out on the street or in jail or dead, which is a lot more common today than it was before. It is, and the, it's those small compromises. I remember hearing about that when I was at Dunklin'. They were talking about, like, uh, you know, you slowly start his listening to psychedelic music or secular music, and then you, you know, next thing you know, you're cursing. And now it's like, you know, you pick up a hooker, and, you know, it's a little bit more intensified. But um, it, the commitment thing, if it's working, don't break it, you know? Like, the suggestions that they offered, I, I didn't take them as suggestions. I took them as, like... I have to. Do this or you're going to fucking die, you dumbass. The big book, that Monday night um, meeting I go to, we read this big book. And for, I'd say, five or six years, this was like the King James version of the Bible to me. I could not understand the motherfucker. I'd just sit there and look at these words. And it was like, what is this? And I'm five years sober at this point, you know? So I know I didn't do a thorough thorough evaluation of my life at that time at five years so i um i continue to go through this i just had to do another four step like another four step um like three four weeks ago and it was something that was really weighing on me and it was i'm also turning 40 years old i don't know if it's something to do with that but i mean like my life was in shambles here and here and i had the only way i knew how to fix it and you know a buddy of mine brian from california little douchebag also has bad teeth he fucking he, he called me out, teeth? huh? He had bad teeth. Oh, dude! Are he showed him fake. To, hell yeah, they're fake. <laughs> Let's get that picture up there of those motherfuckers. <laughs> he looked at me and I was like, dude. But great fucking dude. He called me out on my shit and he's like, yo, maybe you need to do a four step with me. And I knew in my heart like that's what I need, bro. That's, that's why what I, I don't need. want to do it. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. And um, it's those uncomfortable things that I do to this day. That helped keep me sober. I had, it's Easter today, happy Easter. I had my whole family in my house and I tolerated them. I did more than tolerate it. I enjoyed that because I'm able to be the person that we could all get together. You ain't got to worry about Derek. He ain't going to be a fucking shit show robbing you. You ain't got to put your purses in your car and lock your door anymore. Well, I'm glad you enjoyed it, but this is, I'm the exact opposite. And today, during Easter, the crazy woman in my life that uh, will kill me one day. I went to her family's house, and it's funny because, you know, enough time in AA, you realize how everything's connected. When I first came to Florida, I lived in Fort Lauderdale. The girl who lived next door was a public defender, or worked for the public defender's office. And she kind of kept me out of a lot of trouble in 2013 or 14 when I came down here. Years later, I meet this girl's stepdad. He was the head public defender, or he's a big shot. He said he watched these, so what's up, Owen? What up? And for him to be connected to that girl, it kind of tied everything together. I'm questioning things at the time, but I know I'm going in the right direction. But anyway, they have lots of people over, and I hate people, and I hate holidays, and I have to sit there, and tennis and golf are playing, and people are talking about things that way out of my tax bracket. But I was able to sit there and not think about blowing my brains out. And I definitely got to sit there without thinking about getting high. But when I started thinking back to other Easter's and other Christmases, I felt like I was held hostage. When I, my ex-wife, when I was trying to be a pretend stepdad and a pretend husband, those days when we weren't working because it was a holiday, I'd rather be on the chain gang digging ditches on the side of the road than in a house full of family members all having fun, enjoying life, because I didn't know how to fucking do that. I'm miserable. And unless I have a good handful of different pills and a loaded <laughs> syringe somewhere in the bathroom, this holiday is torture and I hate it. But I am able to make it today. 
and sort of be a semi-normal person. Even though it's not really my family and I can ditch them any fucking time, which feels great. They but, probably don't like you just as much, bro. And that's okay, but as long as they pretend. Hey, so this, this guy, Leroy, when I met him, I didn't realize how grumpy and how much of a complainer <laughs> this dude was. And now, I wasn't even going to say that I'm his boss, but now that like we work together and I see this fucking dude... I've never seen anyone complain about so much shit. And I was telling my wife about you last night, dude. And I'm like, you know what he reminds me of? Remember that picture in the late... It was like the 85 or 95, something like that. It was the bitter beer face. Because that's what you remind me of. But I mean, what I was getting at is your heart for AA. I don't know what happened or they miswired you or something. But that is what your your heart is. And then everything else is just pissed off. (laughs) bald and fucking fuck you all well and i do agree with that and i often say that you know my first addiction is anger my second addiction is complaining and i love doing it but it is nothing like it used to be you think i'm angry now you have not seen shit fuck my sobriety (laughs) i have not put hands around somebody (laughs) since february of 2019 like that's important to me because i used to be so much worse and everything ended up in a fight and everything ended up in police showing up and yes i'm still a complainer and i'm still angry and i'll always be bald but it's so much better than i used to be and i'm fucking okay with that and i mean in the, it's the construction industry we have clashing clashing uh, personalities all the time we have to work with the same people day in and day out and some of them drink alcohol constantly and smell terrible <laughs> but not on the job but i mean to to be around that and to be sober i think it's pretty cool man because we have i don't know <laughs> we're dying breed over there local guy right now but i mean I, we have quite a few of sobriety people there and um it's nice to have that camaraderie where we we all know we're going through the same shit but you know you got my back and i got yours unfortunately and you there comes a time in your sobriety where when you're starting off you might see people doing stuff and be jealous of it or be like oh i wish i could do that when i was in the halfway house just at a jail day labor place was giving us rides and this kid's bottle of xanax was rolling on the ground like and it took a lot to not grab it but still at that point i was like i'm not going to do it but i wish i could but now being this deep in you see people showing up to work smelling like beer <laughs> when they drank all weekend I see nothing glamorous about that whatsoever. Getting in an attic at 120 degrees, dude, after drinking all night or something? I don't know how... I, my body physically would not be able to do it. Or watching other people that you've worked with get high again and just watch the personality change and the way it goes downhill so fucking fast. I look at that and maybe it's because of my age. Maybe it's because of hey, hey, but I never want to fucking do that again. And I cannot imagine ever throwing this all away just to get high or just to get drunk. No, you can't imagine it, but sometimes, dude, if you're not being proactive on your recovery, that fucking shit, Satan will slide right in there. Oh, man. Absolutely. You know, he comes in. It's the cunning, baffling part. That's why I do shit like this in my free time. Yeah. And I don't have free time. I'm always doing AA or DAA shit. always on call. That fucking shit, too. If anything does make me drink, it'll be being on call one day. Yeah, me too. (laughs) Well, maybe we can do it together. (laughs) The other day I get a phone call. Uh, Brian hits me up and he's like, Hey, I got this guy from California that wants to... um, He's looking for a sponsee, and I was like, hell yeah, finally. I've been looking for one. You know, I assume God's just going to put him right in front of me. It's been like a year that I've been looking this guy shows up, so I, I hit him up. I'm like, yo, I'll pick you up tomorrow. You can go to the gym with me. And I thought about that. My buddy's like, well, what do you look like, you know? So he ends up being, you know, not in shape, but he's not out of shape. So I pick him up at like 6.45 in the morning, and he texts me when I'm outside. He's like, I'm at Artesian House. And then he's like, he's like uh, yo, you mind if my boy comes with us? And I'm trying to, like, do the introductory thing. So I'm like, yeah, I don't care, whatever. So we go to Crunch. They won't let him in. He's got an out-of-state ID. So I got to put him on an account, you know, to get him to go to the gym so I could talk to him for 30 minutes with his fucking buddy and try to figure out if I could help this fucking dude. It ended up working out great. His buddy, I really liked him too. So I got a sponsee now, and that's what makes this whole program work is, you know, the evolution of continuing the steps. Um, 
is one of my sponsees. Just got a sponsee. I actually have not met the sponsee, but I can assume. That's another part. There's many people that finish their steps and don't get sponsees. And guess what happens? They end up getting fucked up. This is, unfortunately, a lifelong process that we can never stop. Because the second we do is when we get fucked up. And in 2024, getting fucked up means we're probably going to die. Without a doubt, man. And uh, for that, I'm happy to be sober. <laughs>